but it is a very re re renewing. The every uh, every month there is a new information regarding the regarding hypertension. The management of the hypertension is going to be modified. How low level the blood pressure should be maintained. It is also gradually changing. So with all these things, I think this uh, seminar on the hypertension is a very uh, time worthy and to celebrate the World Hypertension Day. National Heart Foundation in conjunction with the Servia has arranged this session, uh, this program. So uh, I again thank uh, our Sir Professor uh, uh, Brigadier Abdul Mali and the moderator and the speaker, keynote speaker, Professor Fozila and my learned colleagues who are present here. And thank you very much for inviting me here. Thank you. Let us join and uh, enjoy this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I would now request Professor M. A. Bashar of Dhaka National Medical College. He's the head of Department of Cardiology there to say a word, few words. Sir, if you are with us, we would be delighted if you could say a few words for us. Thank you, Professor Fazilatul Nessa, for inviting me to tell a few words in this August gathering, in this virtual meeting. Respected chief guest, National Professor Brigadier Abdul Malik Sir, I congratulate him for getting the very renowned and very important award, and we feel proud of him. And the renowned cardiologist of the country, dear uh, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen. Essential hypertension, you know, is a global epidemic. It covers the 95% of the hypertensive population. Approximately more than <laughs> 1 billion people of the world has been suffering from hypertension. Interestingly, hypertension does not come alone. It is always accompanied by, all the time, most of the time, accompanied by diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, and the obesity. Essentially, interestingly, this, all these risk factors leads to the cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. So we should be very cautious in dealing with the hypertension. And early detection is very important. And early treatment is essential to reduce the mortality and morbidity. It is, a weird, it is a matter of regret that most of our physicians, if we criticize ourselves, we see that we do not see the blood pressure. We do not record the blood pressure while writing the prescription. You know, we write many drugs. The drugs also increase the blood pressure. So it should be mandatory to see the blood pressure and record the pulse. It, is, it should be mandatory. And counseling of the patients is very essential when they are detected as hypertension. And treatment of hypertension is lifelong. We should mention always. And never we should stop the drug suddenly. And we should be very cautious regarding the sudden lowering of the blood pressure. It is also dangerous. We must assure the patient and time to time follow up is very essential. And you know, this sort of this sort of seminar and symposium very essential for us. I must congratulate uh, Serbia Bangladesh operation for organizing this important symposium. And we feel proud of National Heart Foundation for arranging this seminar and taking troubles to invite us. And we feel proud of this institute. And we need to have a guideline so that our people get the rational feedback for hypertension. By discussion and interaction, we must overcome this. And again and again, I must congratulate the authority of the Heart Foundation, including our uh, renowned national professor, Vikinder Maleksar, and Professor Fazilatul Nessa and other colleagues and staffs of the National Heart Foundation. 
and other renowned cardiologists of the country. And I must feel proud to have the participants in this scientific seminar. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. All. Thank you. Uh, uh, now I would request Professor Mir Jamaluddin. He's the director and professor of cardiology, National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases, to say a few words for the August gathering. Assalamu alaikum. I am grateful to be here in this session on essential hypertension, management of essential hypertension. I have, first of all, I have my respect and gratitude to the chief guest of this program of today on the management of essential hypertension, the father of cardiology of Bangladesh, founder of National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases and National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute, former advisor, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, People's Republic of Bangladesh, my teacher, teacher of teachers, National Professor, retired Brigadier K. Malik, sir. Prothame, Ami Amadir Sodor Shikho, Brigadier Sarke Pran Dala Venondon Janai, Uttur of the Chapel Juki, Rashir Shosetona, Shosetona Sistite, Nironton Obodan Rakharjano, World Hypertension League, Kotik, their Excellence Award, World Hypertension League Excellence Award, Orjon Korajano, Eshon Man Apnar, Avon Eshon Man. Shomus to Bangladeshi de Jano, Jati or John Otto Narjan Oshushasto Kamale, Amishubers. Amade of the programmer, moderator, Professor Fazilutana Samale, Professor and Chief Consultant Cardiology, and one of the world renowned international cardiologists, National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute, and other faculties those who are present today. As because we are going to uh, hear the uh, 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 lecture from Professor Fazilat Malik on hypertension, essential hypertension. So I do not want to uh, um, lengthy, make it lengthier. I want to say only a few words on hypertension. It is a non-communicable disease we know and Gradually, the incidence is increasing. Now in Bangladesh, approximately 25% of adult population are suffering from hypertension. And we shall have, and if we see the data worldwide, the 50% of all drugs, meaning that 50% are not getting drugs. Out of this 50%, only 50% are in well control. So uh, to manage hypertension, we shall have to be aware of hypertension, to know the complication, to how to prevent the complication. And if we have the exact idea on this entire subject on hypertension, then we should be able to treat and manage the patients of hypertension, as well as we could be able to prevent the complications of hypertension. And we know in the, uh, due to this hypertension in our country also uh, gradually increasing in the urban population as well as in the rural population. And the management of this hypertension is not adequate all over the world, I have already told. And so we shall have to manage this patient. And hypertension is a subject not only for cardiologists. This is the subject of all subjects, meaning that all faculty uh, all the disciplines of medical science requires the uh, management of hypertension or know the hypertension. And so it is a very, um, in, a very important subject. And I once again congratulate National Heart Foundation Authority, Hospital and in, uh, Research Institute Authority, as well as the faculties today uh, to participate in this program. And uh, I uh, have, and uh, lastly, I have the res every respect and salam to my teacher, Professor Brigadier Sir. Thank you all. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, participate. Thank you. Uh, 
And now I would request uh, Professor Abdul Wadu Chaudhary to say a few words. He is the professor and head of Department of Cardiology, Dhaka Medical College. Assalamu alaikum. Aajkir a shundor madhu dhupure. Ashwale shopar aghe, amra shopai anundi to. Ehi chunno, je amate deshe, amate shopar guru. Jake amra bolchi father of cardiology of this country. She world hypertension day of Puloke Take Shomanana, they are which international. She should do Unar Shomana, Amate Shobar Shoma. It Unar E Shomatuni at Dine Arun Gorini. Such a Shuruteke, the protesta deeschen, that fossil hulach kinator. Taru to Shuru Hishabe, that Chatru Hishabe. আমাদের কাজ হলো স্যার যে কাজটা করে গেছেন করে যাচ্ছেন সেটার জন্য আমরা এগিয়ে নিতে পারি হাইপারটেনশন একটা ক্রনিক ডিজিজ গ্লোবালি নাম্বার 1 সিঙ্গেল মোস্ট কন্ট্রিবিউটরি ফ্যাক্টর 12.5% অফ অল গ্লোবাল ডেথ रिलेटेड টু হাইপারটেনশন যাতে সেটার কন্ট্রোলে আমাদের সবাইকে ইনভলভ হওয়া উচিত সেটা যেমন আমরা কার্ডিওলজিস্টরা আছি Internist Achen, on another subject to judge Chiki Shogachen, Tadruk in the involvement of Juru. Simple act of blood pressure deca, she accurately judi mezar for a hoy. Tahuli chronic deadly disease to take a mother awareness to diagnosis to amata proper treatment to Shobi Shuru for a shampo. Amate deche already Amate Professor Me Jamas are bulletin. The control of hypertension is very important. 70%, 68% actually, the control is only around 30% of the control. One-third patient in our country, hypertensive, she has no pressure in our country. She has a 2018-19 health and demographic survey report. This is the awareness of the awareness. আমাদের শ্রদ্ধেয় শিক্ষক ন্যাশনাল প্রেস ব্রিগেড মালিক যেটা শুরু করে গেছেন আমরা যদি মিডিয়াকে সরকারকে এনজিও গুলোকে বিভিন্ন শিক্ষা প্রতিষ্ঠানের মাধ্যমে আমাদের বেসিক হেলথ অ্যাওয়ারনেস প্রোগ্রামের অংশ হিসেবে প্রেসার সম্বন্ধে উচ্চ রক্তচাপ সম্বন্ধে যদি আমাদের এই অ্যাওয়ারনেসটা বাড়াতে পারি তাহলে স্যার যে স্বপ্ন দেখে কাজগুলো শুরু করেছিলেন সেটা অনেক বেশি সফল হবে আজকে এই দিনে যেখানে একটা সেমি সুন্দর একটা আয়োজন করা হয়েছে তার জন্য আমি ন্যাশনাল হার্ট ফাউন্ডেশন এন্ড রিসার্চ ইনস্টিটিউটের কর্তৃপক্ষকে বিশেষ করে ফজিলা আপাকে আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি আমি কৃতজ্ঞতা জানাচ্ছি আমাকে কিছু বলার সুযোগ করে দেওয়ার জন্য সামনে থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ ওয়াদুদ নাও অ্যাকচুয়ালি অ্যাজ টাইম ইজ শর্ট উই উইল as uh, our, our guest uh, panel of experts, Professor Golam Azam to say a few words. And then we will ask uh, Professor Khandukar Kamrul Islam, who's also a guest panel of experts to say a few words. So, professor Golam Azam, we would be very grateful if you could say a few words. He's the professor of cardiology, National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases. Thank you, madam. Good evening to everyone. First of all, I should express my humble gratitude and respect to our National Professor Brigadier M. Malik, who is the father of cardiology, who introduced cardiology in Bangladesh. Very from the very with the very hardship. Now we are in good shape. As because as you know, every father tried to comfortable environment for his descendants. So now we are comfortably treat in our, uh, our present in our country, but it's my honor and privilege to be here with you and we believe our National Professor Vigitra Malik Sir, he set, a, a set as an example where we should work together and we should follow his mission and vision and I hope it will help a lot for our future directions and thank you very much thank you 
And now I would request Professor Khandukar Kamrul Islam, Professor of Cardiology, Universal Medical College and Hospital, uh, to say a few words. Professor Kondokar Kamrul Islam. <clears throat> I believe he's not here. So we can uh, move on to our chief guest, our um, panel of experts and chairpersons from our own institute. They will <clears throat> be interacting and telling us their opinions as the uh, session goes along. So now I would request our chief guest, Professor Malik, sir, to say a few words. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Professor Sophie Badumdar, Professor Fujalitun Samalik, Ebong Uinno. I mean, I'm so very bold as in a monogram. Amar Prio Chikisho window. Ebong there are participants. Okay, Salam Alekum. Ask a coroner in number physically meet Korte Partisina. আমরা ভার্চুয়ালি তো প্রথমে আজকে এই সবার বিগিনিং এ আমার প্রিয় ছাত্ররা যারা আজকে কালিয়োজি অঙ্গনে নাম করেছেন তারা আমার সম্বন্ধে অনেক কিছু বলেছেন এজন্য আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি আমি মনে করি সমস্ত প্রশংসা আল্লাহ মানুষ নিমিত্তের বাকি আমি আমার জীবনে চেষ্টা করেছি আল্লাহ সহায়তা দিয়েছেন এবং মনে রাখবেন মানুষের আল্লাহ তালা ইচ্ছা শক্তি দিয়েছে আপনি ভালো বন্ধ চিন্তা করতে পারেন ভালো পথে চলতে পারেন খারাপ পথে চলতে পারেন এবং ইচ্ছা শক্তি ভালো এবং ঠিক নিয়ত নিয়ে যদি আপনি কাজ করতে শুরু করেন আল্লাহর সহায়তা আসে তো আমি চেষ্টা করেছি এর জন্য আমি গ্রেটফুল এবং আমি আপনাদের সবকে এটাই বলব যে কাজ আপনি শুরু করতে পারেন কিন্তু কাজের ফল কি হবে সফলতা আসবে না বিফল হবেন এটা কিন্তু আপনি জানেন না কিন্তু সাধারণত নিয়ত ঠিক থাকলে আল্লাহ কাউকে বিফল করেন না আমার আজকে গ্রেটফুল টু আল্লাহ তার মাসের জন্য এটা হয়েছে এবং এই যে সম্মাননা আমার আসছে এটা আমার এখা নয় এটা আমি নিমিত্ত বাগি আপনারা অনেকেই এর অংশীদার আপনারা আমার পরে কাজ করে যাচ্ছেন বাংলাদেশকে আজকে কার্যালয়তে নিয়ে গেছেন এই জন্য আমি আপনাদের ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি আমি যখন আমরা শুরু করি দেশ স্বাধীন হলো সেভেন্টি ওয়ানে তখন এই দেশে কিছুই ছিল না কার্যালয় কি ছিল এটা স্টেথোস্কোপ অ্যান ইসিজি মেশিন অ্যান এক্স এ মেশিন এর বাইরে কিছু ছিল না আজকে আল্লাহর অশেষ মেহরবানি এবং আপনাদের সবের কাজের ফসল হিসাবে আজকে আমরা আপনারা আন্তর্জাতিক অঙ্গন বিচরণ করতেছেন যদি না আমার খুবই ভালো লাগে এবং আমি আল্লাহর কাছে দোয়া করি আপনারা এগিয়ে যান মানুষের সেবা করেন এবং মনে রাখবেন যদি কোনো কারণে ব্যর্থ হন তাহলে আবার নিরাশ হবেন না ধৈর্য সহকারে বার চেষ্টা করবেন এই যে আপনি জানেন না কোনটা আপনার জন্য মঙ্গল আপনি যেটা মনে করছেন আপনার ব্যর্থতা এটা হয়তো আপনার আরেকটা সফলতা হতে পারে ইন্ডিকেশন কাজেই কোনো সময় সফল হলে আল্লাহ শুক্রিয়া আদায় করবেন এবং হাম্বুল থাকবেন আর যদি বিফল হন তাহলে নিরাশ হয়ে ছেড়ে দিবেন না পথ ধরে রাখবেন আজকে যেটা আজকে যেটা বিভচ্য আলোচনা হচ্ছে হাইপার টেনশন এটা আমাদের জাতির জন্য নয় সমস্ত বিশ্বের জন্য সমস্যা এবং আজকে আপনাদের একটা কথা বলি আমি যখন সেভেন্টি থ্রিতে পিজিতে বর্তমান বঙ্গবন্ধু শেখ মুজিব মেডিকেল ইউনিভার্সিটি ছিলাম তখন আমাদের দেশে হৃদরোগের পিসির প্রিভেলেন্স সম্বন্ধে কোনো আইডিয়া ছিল না আমারও ছিল না জন্য আমি তখন বাংলাদেশ মেডিকেল রিসার্চ সহায়তায় 
ঢাকা এবং সারাউন্ডিং এরিয়াতে একটা ছোট্ট সার্ভে চালিয়েছিলাম এই সার্ভেতে দেখা গেল এক নম্বর হাইপার টেনশন দুই নম্বর তখন ছিল রিউমেটিক হার্ট ডিজিজ তার ছিল ইস্কিমিক হার্ট ডিজিজ এইটি এইটটি ফাইভে আবার করেছিলাম ডিভিশনাল হেডকোয়ার্টারে সেখানেও দেখা গেল উচ্চ রক্তচাপ নম্বর ওয়ান রিউমেটিক তখনও ছিল সেকেন্ড তার ছিল ইস্কিমিক বর্তমানে কী হয়েছে হাইপার টেনশন এখনও রয়ে গেছে এবং দিন দিন বেড়েই চলছে সুতরাং হাইপার টেনশন এমন একটা রোগ যে রোগ থাকবে করোনা ভাইরাস কন্ট্রোল হয়ে যাবে অন্যান্য যেটা কমিউনিকেবল ডিজিজ সেগুলো কন্ট্রোল হবে কিন্তু এই যে নন কমিউনিকেবল ডিজিজ উচ্চ রক্তচাপ এটা দিন দিন মানুষের জীবন দ্বারা পরিবর্তনের সাথে সাথে আমাদের খাদ্যাভাস কাজ না করা এই ফলে বেড়েই চলবে সুতরাং এটা থাকবে এবং এটাকে কন্ট্রোল যদি আমরা না করতে পারি তাহলে আমরা আমাদের উন্নয়ন অর্থনৈতিক উন্নয়ন যেটা আমরা ধরে রাখতে পারবো না করতেও পারবো না আজকে আপনারা যেটা উচ্চ রক্তচাপ নিয়ে আলোচনা করতেছেন এটা অত্যন্ত সময় উপযোগী এবং আমার মনে হয় আমরা খুব সিরিয়াসলি এটা করতে হবে এবং আমাদের শুধু কার্যালয়িস্ট না সমাজের অন্যান্য যারা আছেন যারা চিকিৎসক কিন্তু আছেন বিভিন্ন পেশায় স্বাস্থ্যকর্মী সবেরই দায়িত্ব যার কাছেই যখন কোনো রুগী যাবে সে যেন তার প্রেশারটা দেখে এবং এটা যেন সাইলেন্ট কিলার বলা হয় এবং এটা সত্যি সাইলেন্ট কিলার এবং মানুষ যখন জানে না জানলে অনেক সময় গাফলাতি করে তাদের আমাদের এটা বারবার বলতে হবে মানুষকে সুস্থ রাখতে হবে এবং আমি অত্যন্ত আনন্দিত যে আমাদের স্বাস্থ্য মন্ত্রণালয় এবং স্বাস্থ্য অধিদপ্তর এবং আমরা হার্ট ফাউন্ডেশন মিলে কিছু হার্ট ফাউন্ডেশনের সরি হাইপার টেনশনের উপরে কিছু প্রজেক্ট নেওয়া হয়েছে আমাদের রিজর্ট ও সেভ লাইফ আমেরিকান অর্গানাইজেশন এটা নিয়ে বর্তমানে ছয়টা জেলায় চুয়ান্নটা উপজেলায় শুরু হয়েছে এবং আমরা আশা করি সরকারের সহায়তায় তারপরে স্বাস্থ্য অধিদপ্তরের সহায়তায় আলটিমেট আমরা সমস্ত বাংলাদেশে এই প্রিভেনশন প্রোগ্রাম ছড়িয়ে দিতে পারবো এবং এটা অত্যন্ত জরুরি ডিটেকশন ইজ ইম্পর্টেন্ট বারবার বলা উচিত সচেতনা সৃষ্টি করা উচিত এবং গরিব রুগীদের ঔষধ দিতে হবে বারবার দিয়ে আমরা যদি করি ইনশাল্লাহ তাহলে হাইপার টেনশনকে আমরা কন্ট্রোল করতে পারবো এবং আমরা জনগণকে সুস্থ রাখতে পারবো আমার বক্তব্য দীর্ঘায়িত করব না আপনারা শুরু করেছেন আমি অত্যন্ত আনন্দিত যে আপনারা আনন্দ খুব আন্তরিকতার সহিত করতেছেন এবং মনে রাখবেন সততা নিষ্ঠার সহিত যদি আপনার কাজ করেন তা আল্লাহর সহায়তা আসবে এবং আমরা যেটা কাজ করি সেটা এটা সেবাধর্মী কর্ম এই সেবাধর্মী কর্মে নিয়ত অত্যন্ত জরুরি আপনি যে ধর্মেরই হোক না কেন মনে রাখবেন মানুষের সেবাই রিয়েলি পরম ধর্ম আপনি এবাদত করেন নামাজ রোজা পূজা অর্চনা যাই করেন আপনি জানেন না সেটা আপনার অ্যাকসেপ্ট হচ্ছে কি না কিন্তু আপনি যদি আন্তরিকতার সহিত সেবা করেন সেটাই পরম যে আমরা এই সেবা ধর্মী কাজে আসি আমরা প্রত্যেকে যে যতদিন বাসি যেখানেই থাকি না কেন আমরা যেন নিয়ত ঠিক রেখে আমরা যেন কাজ করি মনে রাখবেন আমরা সব রুগীকে ভালো করে দিতে পারব না অনেক রুগী আমাদের মারা যায় কিন্তু আমাদের যেন চেষ্টার যেন কোনো ত্রুটি না থাকে আমার বক্তব্য দীর্ঘায়িত করবো না আপনাকে আজ আজকে আমাকে আমন্ত্রণ জানিয়েছেন ধন্যবাদ এবং আমাদের সিনিয়র যারা কার্ডিওলজি তারা আজকে বিভিন্ন ক্ষেত্রে অবদান রাখছেন তাদের ধন্যবাদ জানাই এবং আমি বিশ্বাস করি আপনারা বাংলাদেশকে এগিয়ে যাবেন বাংলাদেশ আমাদের স্বাধীন হয়েছে এবং আমার মনে হয় আমরা চেষ্টা করলে আমরা অনেক পারব এবং মনে রাখবেন আমাদের অভ্যাস খারাপ আমি আমার কাজ না করে অন্যের কাজ নিয়ে সমালোচনা করি তা আপনি আপনার কাজটাই করেন ভালো করেন অন্য কে কিনলো সেটা দরকার নাই চেষ্টা করেন নিজে ভালো হতে আমি যদি ভালো হই আমার ফ্যামিলি ভালো হবে পরিবার ভালো হবে আমার জাতি ভালো হবে সমস্ত বিশ্ব ভালো হবে তাদের আমরা যেন আন্তরিকভাবে কাজ করি এবং আজকে যারা পার্টিসিপেন্ট আছেন আমি অনুরোধ করব আপনারা ভালো করে শুনবেন শিখবেন এবং যা পড়বেন শিখবেন চিন্তা করবেন চিন্তা না করলে এক কান দিয়ে যাবে অন্য কান দিয়ে চলে যাবে তাদের চেষ্টা করবেন ইনশাল্লাহ আমি 
আপনাদের সাফল্য কামনা করি এবং আমি বিশ্বাস করি বাংলাদেশকে আপনারা এগিয়ে নেবেন এবং চিরদিন সময় সুৎকারের জন্য অপেক্ষা করে না চিরদিন কেউ থাকতে পারবে না আপনার ও আপনাদের উত্তরসূরি আরো গড়ে তুলে যান বাংলাদেশ এগিয়ে গেছে আরো যেন যেতে পারে এই জন্য আমি দোয়া করি এবং আপনাদের কামনা সুফল্য সাফল্য কামনা করি অশেষ ধন্যবাদ আশা করি এটা খুব উপকৃত হবে এবং বাংলাদেশ থেকে আমরা যেন হৃদযোগ উচ্চ রক্তচাপ এগুলা যেন কন্ট্রোল করতে পারি থ্যাংক ইউ ভেরি মাছ থ্যাংক ইউ Thank you, sir, for your inspiring uh, lecture. You always truly really inspire us. And uh, as uh, everyone says, you are an inspiration to all of us and definitely the father of cardiology. And uh, we hope and we strive uh, to uh, be uh, better human beings because of people like you in Bangladesh. Thank you. Again. So now we will go to our... So now we will go to the... the main program we have uh, four presentations uh, so uh, and after this we will have a discussion and our panel of experts and chairpersons uh, will participate in that and uh, all the participants are also free to ask any questions in the chat box so we were planning to have the lectures back to back just to save time but if you have any queries or anything in between the chairpersons and the panel of experts can ask them So first of all, without further ado, I will ask Dr. Smita Kanungo uh, to present uh, and tell us about definition, classification, epidemiology, and pathophysiology of hypertension. He's working as a registrar in Department of Cardiology, National Heart Foundation Hospital and Research Institute. So, Dr. Smita Kanungo. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, madam, for the introduction. honorable chief guest chairperson ch moderator panel of expert and respected audience once again a very good afternoon and warm welcome you all to the presentation before going to the presentation here is a scenario a 45 years gentleman was referred to an hf hypertension clinic though the gentleman didn't give any history of hypertension or diabetes but on examination he was found to have a blood pressure of 150 over 90 millimeter of mercury so with this blood pressure what would be his diagnosis should we diagnose the patient gentleman as hypertensive or what could be done next to find out the answer let's have a brief discussion on hypertension its definition classification prevalence indication national society of hypertension recommended that hypertension to be diagnosed when a person's systolic blood pressure either in office or clinic is equal or more than 140 mm of mercury and or his uh, diastolic blood pressure is equal or more than 90 mm of mercury following repeated examination and this repeated examination is very important as because diagnosis of hypertension should not be made on a single office visit at least two to three of his visits at one to four weeks interval depending on the blood pressure level are required to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension but if a patient has a blood pressure equal or more than 180 by 110 mm of mercury or there is evidence of cardiovascular disease so the diagnosis might be made on a single visit there are a number of guidelines including our national guidelines said to classify blood pressure and grading of hypertension according to our national guideline blood pressure one level less than 120 by 80 mm was uh, categorized as optimal and they categorized hypertension or stage 1 hypertension with a systolic blood pressure 140 to 159 mm of mercury and or diastolic blood pressure 90 to 99 mm of mercury isolated systolic hypertension was defined equal or more than 140 mm of mercury and diastolic blood pressure less than 90 mm of mercury and this guide classification and guidelines is almost similar with the european society of cardiology hypertension guideline which was published in 2018 but according to the american college of cardiology hypertension guideline they differ with the staging of hypertension and they categorized 
stage one hypertension with a systolic blood pressure 130 to 139 millimeter of mercury or diastolic blood pressure 80 to 89 millimeter of mercury. Moreover, here they didn't include the stage three hypertension category. Here is the uh, 2018 European Society of Hypertension Guidelines. As we, I mentioned, this uh, guideline is almost similar with the, our national guidelines, uh, including the definition of isolated systolic hypertension. In 2020, International Society of Hypertension introduced a global hypertension practice guidelines where they categorized less than 130 over 85 millimeter of mercury blood pressure is normal blood pressure and grade one hypertension is categorized into with a systolic blood pressure of 140 to 159 millimeter of mercury and our diastolic blood pressure 90 to 99 millimeter of mercury and systolic hypertension definition is remain as same as before. Here is at a glance, a comparison between the three international guidelines. Here you can see the grade one is a slightly different from ACC or AHA guideline. Sometimes patient may visit with elevated blood pressure only in the office, but normal and non-elevated blood pressure at home. And these conditions are termed as white coat hypertension. About 10 to 30 percent patients have white coat hypertension. And the reverse condition is known as marks of hypertension where blood pressure is normal or non-elevated in the office but elevated in the home. 10 to 15 percent patients have marked hypertension. So out of office blood pressure measurement is often necessary for the accurate diagnosis and treatment options for the hypertension. And this measurement is usually carried out by home blood pressure monitoring or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. According to the International Society of Hypertension, criteria for home blood pressure monitoring is equal or more than 135 systolic blood pressure and or diastolic blood pressure equal or more than 85 millimeter of mercury. And ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, the criteria to diagnose hypertension is uh, 24 hour average blood pressure should be equal or more than 130 millimeter of mercury and or diastolic BP equal or more than 80 millimeter of mercury. Hypertension can be classified according to the cause with primary hypertension and secondary hypertension. Primary essential hypertension is defined when the underlying cause of hypertension is not known. The majority of the causes of hypertension contribute primary hypertension, about 90 to 95% of adult patients. And when high blood pressure is as a result of other medical problems or medication, it is known as secondary hypertension, which is about 5 to 10% of adult patients. Um, any younger patient with uh, elevated BP should be suspected to have secondary hypertension. There are a number of etiological factors that may cause secondary hypertension. Among them, the commonest causes are renal parenchyma and renovascular disease, primary aldosteronism, obstructive sleep apnea, which contribute to one of major portion of uh, secondary hypertension, and some drugs or alcohol uh, in the used to secondary hypertension. And there are some drugs or substance that may induce secondary hypertension. There is, is a list of that drugs or uh, substances. Among them, non-NSIT, oral contraceptive pill, amphetamine, cocaine are important. Though the etiological cause of essential hypertension is not known, but there are a number of risk factors which may contribute to develop essential hypertension. And these risk factors are divided into two groups. Modifiable risk factors, which include high sodium and low potassium intake, alcohol, smoking, diabetes mellitus, high cholesterol, obesity, physical inactivity, and unhealthy diet. And there is another group classified as a relative fixed risk factors, which include psychosocial stress, premature birth, chronic kidney disease, family history, increased age, male, person and uh, low socioeconomic status and obstructive sleep apnea are the part of relative fixed risk factors. 
regarding the prevalence an estimated 1.4 billion people worldwide have high blood pressure but just 14% have it under control and in the us a survey was conducted in the period of 2017 to 18 where they showed the prevalence of hypertension was 45.4% among the adults and among them male were more hypertensive in comparison to the Mm-hmm. women and this prevalence is in cons- consistent with the irrespective of high middle and lower economic condition of the people and hypertension prevalence of bangladesh was first reported in 1976 by national professor brigadier richard abdul malik which was 1.10% and next it was reported in 2012 by professor shafi mozumdar which is approximately 20% In 2018, according to the survey for non-communicable disease risk factor in Bangladesh, around 21% of adult aged 18 years or more have hypertension, and among them, only 54.3 persons who are hypertensive are aware of their conditions. And the 18% of hypertensive population are diagnosed but untreated. 16. 5% are treated but uncontrolled and only 11% of patients who are taking medications of hypertension achieve a good blood pressure control so the complete scenario is quite alarming for us the pathogenesis of primary hypertension is multifactorial and complex factors that play a role in pathogenesis of hypertension include activation of sympathetic nervous system vascular endothelial dysfunction renin angiotensin aldosterone system and activation of sympathetic nervous system may induce hypertension through its several mechanism including vascular endothelial dysfunction and producing some vasoconstrictor which in turn causes increased systemic vascular resistance and thus induce hypertension they may also cause increased cardiac output and modulation of abnormal renal uh, salt and water excretion all these uh, mechanism in turn causes uh, hypertension and sometimes it may cause a high i mean appropriately high release of uh, renin which activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system which is one of the most important mechanism of hypertension contributing it uh, to vascular endothelial dysfunction and production of uh, angiotensin which is a very potent vessel constrictor and thus uh, induce hypertension so why we are giving much very much importance on this hypertension in 2020 international society of hypertension practice guideline stated that each 2 mm rise in systolic blood pressure is associated with a 7% increased risk of ischemic heart disease and 10% increased risk of stroke and according to the european heart journal a 10 mm of reduction of systolic blood pressure or 5 mm reduction of diastolic blood pressure is associated with significant reduction in all major cardiovascular events by 20% all causes of mortality by 10 to 15% stroke by 35% coronary events by 20% and heart failure by 40% so measure your blood pressure control eat and live longer with the theme of world hypertension day i would like to thank you all thank you the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity may i now request our next speaker dr taufik shariyada hawk associate professor national heart foundation hospital and research institute to have his presentation on symptom signs and investigations of hypertension thank you dr smita honorable chairperson national professor brigadier malik sir uh, respected teachers and trainers in the panel of uh, chairpersons and panelists a very good afternoon today i am honored to be a part of this scientific seminar uh, on the occasion of world hypertension day i am going to have my presentation on symptoms signs and investigation of hypertension So, if we start from the very basics, blood is a very important element of our body homeostatic system. 
it transports respiratory gases, carries nutrients, transports hormones, and transports metabolic waste. It regulates our body pH, adjusts body, and maintains body temperature, and maintains water balance. It protects us from infection, it reserves substances, and performs hemostasis. To perform all these functions, it has to travel to all corners, all remote cor corners of our body, starting from the lungs to the kidneys to the gastrointestinal tract to the endocrine system, everywhere. And it flows through the vascular system. And to keep it flowing through the vascular system, an optimum pressure is required, which is generated by the heart and which is maintained by complex and interconnected uh, systems of our body. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some of these systems are, are responsible for secondary hypertension. All these things has already been mentioned by our uh, previous speaker. Uh, so when the blood pressure starts to rise, we all know there are some adaptive changes in our uh, cardiovascular system. We are aware about the concentric and eccentric hypertrophy of the heart, uh, but we rarely uh, look into the uh, internal eutrophic uh, remodeling an internal hypertrophic remodeling of the uh, arteries and arterioles. The essential hypertension, uh, in essential hypertension, there is inward eutrophic remodeling, and in some secondary form of hypertension, there is hypertrophic remodeling. These remodelings uh, maintains the uh, st uh, ma maintains the stress in the vascular media, but at the same time has some uh, consequences. The maximum vasodilation, vasodilatation is reduced due to this. There is reduced vasodilator reserve, vasomotor response is enhanced, and at given shortening, it will induce exaggerated vasoconstriction. The density of the microvasculature is re reduced due to these remodelings, and as a consequence of these prunings, resistance is increased and the maximum tissue perfusion is restricted. All these are the basis of symptoms of, uh, of elevated blood pressure. But when we are asked uh, by our patients, our friends, our parents, uh, what are the symptoms of hypertension? We, uh, in this era of uh, rocket and nuclear science, we have to say almost all the patients are asymptomatic. But when symptoms occur, the initial symptoms may be like this headache, neck pain, dizziness, vertigo, easy fatigue, irritability, lack of con concentration, sleeplessness. Uh, when the person uh, fails to come into contact uh, with a physician and fails to control his blood pressure at this level, he may have a set of severe symptoms like pounding in chest, neck on ears due to mild exertion. There might, may be chest pain. There may be difficulty in breathing. He may notice irregular heartbeat. He may notice uh, nosebleeds. He may notice blood spots in the eyes. He have, may have uh, visual problems. He also may notice high colored urine. There are some other uh, systemic symptoms which may be attributed to um, high blood pressure, like dementia, accelerated osteoporosis, pulmonary embolism, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, which may be a cause or may be uh, related to um, uh, high blood pressure. There may be erectile dysfunction and reduced aerosol. Still, when all these symptoms are occurring and the person is still um, negligent or fails to control his blood pressure, he may land into a, a group of troubles like uh, visual disturbance, convulsion, patchy uh, neurological deficit due to hypertensive encephalopathy, tearing back pain with asymmetrical pulse due to dissecting aortic aneurysm, acute shortness of breath due to acute pulmonary edema, severe chest pain due to acute myocardial infarction. He may have features of renal failure. He may have lateralizing signs due to intracranial hemorrhage or acute ischemic stroke. Unfortunate uh, pregnant women can have eclampsia with signs of eclampsia and preeclampsia. So the one physical examination that is needed to confirm the diagnosis of high blood pressure is measuring the blood, blood pressure. I don't want to go into the details. This has been discussed uh, in different uh, talk shows, but only a few points. The, pers the person whose blood pressure is going to be measured must rest for five minutes in a comfortable chair with backrest and armrest. We must give him 30 minutes time to refrain from smoking and uh, drinking caffeine. And blood pressure uh, needs to be measured in both arms with appropriate sized cuff 
two two readings one minute apart difference uh, between the two arms in systolic blood pressure of 20 mm or diastolic of 10 mm make trigger further investigations of vascular abnormalities the heart rate needs to be measured at resting state for increased rate or irregular rhythm we also should not forget to auscultate uh, the carotid arteries renal arteries and the chest we should measure the uh, body mass index of the patient uh, if you want to come to a diagnosis of uh, cardiac syndrome x our physical examination sh should also aim at finding uh, signs of secondary hypertension diminished and delayed femoral pulse and reduced femoral blood pressure compared to simultaneous arm bp uh, left right arm bp difference all may be related to coarctation or vasculitis auscultation of precordium or chest mar chest murmur auscultation for abdominal murmurs are very important we have to look for signs of cushing syndrome skin stigmata for neuro neurofibromatosis which may be related to pheochromocytoma and we must not forget to palpate the kidneys to look for polycystic kidney disease there may be some signs which may indicate uh, hypertension mediated organ damage like uh, sensory or motor deficit for central nervous system effects fundoscopic abnormalities uh, apical impulse of the heart may be abnormal third and fourth heart sound or murmurs may be audible if there is cardiac uh, involvement uh, peripheral arterial pulses are very important we have already discussed and carotid arteries should be uh, auscultated for uh, systolic bruise the investigations uh, besides the measuring the blood pressure are aimed towards towards looking for presence of additional risk factors searching for secondary causes of secondary hypertension looking for the absence or presence of organ damage and we also do investigations to see the contraindication to or side effects of any antihypertensive medications we are going to be using or is being already used so the routine tests are invaluable hemoglobin and hematocrit the fasting plasma glucose the fasting cholesterol uh, lipid profile the electrolytes the sodium potassium the uric acid the serum creatinine and urine analysis is of utmost importance a 12 lead ecg we should not forget while doing the investigation just like uh, physical finding we should also search for asymptomatic organ damage for the heart an ecg can give clue to uh, left ventricular hypertrophy Uh, atrial enlargement if there is arrhythmia we need to go for long term ecg monitoring and eco and echocardiograph may confirm the findings of the ecg it may give clue to associated valve motion abnormality other diseases or valvular abnormalities and when history suggests we should not uh, forget to do an stress uh, test for ischemic heart disease Uh, ultrasound sc scanning of the carotid uh, femoral arteries and aorta to see accelerated hypertension pulse wave doppler to see the vascular stiffness and ankle brachial e uh, index to find out the peripheral arterial disease is also important for the kidneys we have already mentioned we must uh, look for the um, creatinine and egfr and we should not forget the importance of microalbuminuria and spot urine creatinine ratio to look for uh, occult Uh, renal invo involvement fundoscopic invo fundoscopic examination is very important for resistant hypertension patients and when a hypertensive patients come patient comes to us with cognitive def decline we should do an ct scan or mri to detect silent brain infarction lacunar infarction or micro bleeds in the white matter uh, probably the most uh, complicated or complex part is to look for the hormonal Uh, uh, endocrine causes of secondary hypertension uh, looking for 24 hour urinary cortisol measuring the urinary fractionated methadone epinephrine for pheochromocytoma uh, serum aldosterone renin ratio for primary aldosteronism uh, a bit difficult to perform but uh, are very important when the patient is suffering from resistant hypertension we must not forget about the renal palenchymal disease so renal ultrasound or renal uh, artery Uh, duplex to see for renal artery stenosis i think uh, uh, hypertension is the first piece of uh, domino effect when which it starts it can affect any organ from the brain to toe hence the theme of this year's uh, hypertension day is uh, measure your blood pressure control it for a healthy and long life so how to control it 
uh, I would like to request our chief consultant, Professor Fazilatunisa Malik, to deliver her lecture on evidence-based treatment of hypertension. Professor Fazil Malik, please. Respected chief guest, chairpersons, panel of experts, friends and colleagues. It's indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to be here today. And today I'll be talking about managing hypertension. So why do we want to manage hypertension? Because hypertension kills. It has been said again, and unfortunately, it is the reality that around 11 million people die due to complications of hypertension. And as Smita was pointing out, if we can control our blood pressure, we can reduce myocardial infarction by 20 to 25%, stroke by 35%, heart failure and chronic kidney disease by 50%. So it makes sense, doesn't it, that we treat hypertension. And treating hypertension includes some lifestyle interventions and some drugs. Now, lifestyle interventions really do work. But here, I think the main work is the doctors who has to motivate their patients to do this day in, day out, to be disciplined. It's very easy to say that to an obese patient, okay, if you lose weight, for each kg of weight that you lose, your blood pressure is going to come down one millimeter. So imagine 12 millimeters of blood pressure will come down if you can lose 10 kg of weight. But to motivate a person to do that, you have to be, the physician has to be a life coach. And other things also, like if you take less of salt, blood pressure can come down by five millimeters. Exercising, everyday walking for half an hour. All these things make a good lifestyle and which translate to lower blood pressure. But to do that, the patient has to be disciplined and the doctor has to act as a life coach for their patients. Now, once we have done the lifestyle interventions and we have motivated our patients enough in many of the cases our patients will require drugs and remembering the drugs is a b c d and e so what does a stand for as we all know a stands for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and arb b for beta blockers now we all know that the b has come really down for Hypertensive patients, beta blockers are not now the initial choice for us. Only in compelling situations would we give beta blockers to a hypertensive patients initially. The SEACH stands for calcium channel blockers, D for diuretics, and E for et cetera, which is alpha blockers, riprazosin, which works really well for patients with chronic kidney disease or benign hyperplasia of prostate, centrally acting drugs like clonidine, which works well for um, anxiety, postmenopausal syndrome, et cetera, and ve direct vasodilators like hydralazine, which we use in emergency situations. And by the way, I would like to thank uh, Ashok Dotto, our associate professor who gave me these slides. So thank you for that. So the first drug that we would discuss would be angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, and they all end with the word pril. So it's captopril, enalapril, ramipril, perindropril, et cetera. And we all understand that the shorter acting is uh, captopril. And short acting drugs are really good when we start the medication or when the patient is hospitalized for heart failure or some other situation and we want to see how the patient responds to that drug. We're starting the patient on AC inhibitors, so short acting drugs would be ideal. However, for long acting antihypertensive effect, we would go for a drug like perindropil, which gives us great long 24 hour coverage. And there are other diuretics like lisinopril, um, ramipril, a host of drugs available that we can choose from. Now, next comes the angiotensin receptor blockers, and they all end with 
sartan. So we've got losartan, candy sartan, valsartan, etc. And the longest acting R, tell me sartan and all me sartan. Uh, we know that Valstartan has been extensively studied in heart failure, and it works really well in heart failure. Losartan is a very common, very economic drug that is available in the market. Next comes C, which uh, is the calcium channel blockers. And the calcium channel blockers are very good because they're metabolically neutral. They will not cause any electrolyte imbalance like um, uh, Potentially, AC or ARBs can cause hyperkalemia, as we know. And uh, they are very safe to give even in chronic kidney disease patients. One issue is that calcium channel blockers can cause dependent edema. Uh, and they can give rise to gum hyperplasia. In some situations, they can, can cause flushing, et cetera. But the newer uh, calcium channel blockers, like silnitapine, they do not cause leg edema. After that, we have diuretics. And in the diuretics, we have thiazide type diuretics and thiazide like diuretics. And actually, the thiazide like diuretics like indipramide or chlorthalidone work very well for patients with hypertension. The beta blockers were once uh, the drugs that we chose first, but nowadays we use them way down the line only if the hypertensive patient has concurrent documented coronary artery disease or has already suffered from a myocardial infarction or has issues of arrhythmia, do we start this drug first on? And we need to remember that propranolol, metoprolol, and etanolol uh, are lipid soluble, so they can cross the blood-brain barrier as well as the placental barrier. And that's why we do not usually give these drugs to pregnant ladies. A metoprolol sometimes maybe. Sotalol is more of an anti-arrhythmic drug and uh, carvedilol has both alpha as well as beta effects. Libitolol has five times more alpha effect than beta effect. And bisoprolol is a cardioselective, but all cardioselective drugs, if you give them in higher doses, uh, will uh, also act non-selective actually. And as I was saying, uh, studies and meta-analysis have shown that these are not the drug to use as fast line in hypertension, only when uh, the patient has other overwhelming indications would we give these uh, drugs as fast line, especially to patients uh, who are in heart failure or who patients who have arrhythmias or have suffered from a myocardial infarction. So how do we choose a drug? Now, choosing the drug, I think you re really first have to talk to your patient, understand your patient's socioeconomic situation, and you should give the drug. I mean, the studies can show a drug works fantastically well, but if the, your patient cannot afford it, it won't work well for him in the long term. So you should understand the drug that would suit him well. And other clinical scenarios of the patient, you also need to assess. Like if your patient is very anxious, has tremor, has thyrotoxicosis, maybe you can give him some beta blocker as well. If the uh, patient is on antidepressants, you need to remember that if you start the patient on an AC inhibitor or a calcium channel blocker, he, might, he or she might end up with orthostatic hypertension. If the patient has asthma, uh, beta blockers, we need to use them with caution. A patient has bradycardia, sick sinus syndrome, or heart block, the non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers and beta blockers need to be avoided. In a patient with heart failure, ideally, we would give the patient, obviously, AC inhibitors, diuretics, and beta blockers. If a patient is diabetic, uh, we would first drug would be an AC inhibitor or an ARB. For gout, if we give the patient thiazide diuretics, his gout might be aggravated. And uh, benign hyperplasia of prostate, as we said, prazosine is good. So you need to really understand what your patient has, what are the other concurrent diseases he is suffering from, and then give your drugs. Now, overall benefit treatments 
treatments obviously our target is to lower the blood pressure with minimum of side effects now that is our goal and that is our aim and obviously our patient would uh, it makes sense prefer a once daily dose that covers 24 hours because no one likes to have pills three or four times a day and uh, uh, we would first start the drug with a uh, at a lower dose and we would wait and evaluate the situation not just you know like the patient might be anxious and say my blood pressure isn't coming down what do i do doctor but give your patient some time give five or seven days and then again reevaluate. and ideally if the pressure isn't that high you we can even wait for four weeks before we evaluate one thing we need to remember is that when all else is equal use the least expensive drug because you are giving antihypertensives for a very, very long time, right? Maybe lifelong. And so uh, if it, uh, you can have a least expensive drug, it does make sense. But if money is not an issue, uh, and if it is not a disadvantage, encourage fixed dose combinations because they work well and they give you the patient the ease of having just one pill maybe. So why do we advocate uh, uh, fixed uh, dose combinations? Why? Because we start with two drugs in a lower dose. And what does that translate to? That translates to that the, you are getting additive effects of both those two classes of drugs. Like you say, you're using a calcium channel blocker and you're using an AC inhibitor. So you're getting benefit of both classes of drug and they will have a synergistic effect. And obviously, because you're starting with lower doses of both drugs, you will have less chances of side effects of either. And your patient will be happy because there is ease of just a single tablet. There will be prolonged duration of action and there is a potential uh, of additive target organ protection. So combined pills do make sense, especially when their cost is not an issue. And obviously we do have compelling indications for each class of drugs. And uh, we've already touched on that. So, this is a general overview of what we understand. But what do the guidelines tell us? And recently, we, uh, a few years back, we had in 2017, the ACC AHA guideline for hypertension. We, in 2018, we had the ESC guideline and the International Society of uh, Hypertension guidelines came la out last year. So the interesting fact is that all the guidelines, ACC, AHA, everything, uh, they say for initiation of antihypertensive drugs, the first line in, uh, agent should be either a thiazide diuretic, a calcium channel blocker, an AC inhibitor, or an ARB. So these four are our first line drugs that we should start our patient on. And if you consider a uh, single pill combination. In the single pill combination, uh, in ESC guidelines, uh, if you see the trials that they cited, they cited the ASCOT and the accomplished trial where an AC inhibitor had been combined with a calcium channel blocker. So if you look at the 2018 ESC uh, guidelines, uh, if the patient is very frail, very elderly, or has grade one hypertension not that elevated, you can start the patient with a single dose. Otherwise, start the patient with us two drugs in a single pill combination. And the combination could be an AC inhibitor or an ARB with a calcium channel blocker or a diuretic. You monitor the patient and if the uh, pressure is not coming down satisfactorily after a time, we increase the dose of those two drugs. Even after that, if the pressure is not being well controlled, uh, so if we started the patient on an AC inhibitor and a calcium channel blocker, then we use, add the third drug. And here the third drug would be a diuretic. Even after using three drugs, if the pressure does not come down, then we have to understand that this patient could be a case of resistant hypertension. And in case of a resistant hypertension, we can start the patient on spironolactone, or we can give the patient an alpha blocker or 
give the patient a beta blocker. So the beta blocker has come down very down the list. And here we should also consider sending the patient to a specialist who specializes in controlling hypertension. And regarding beta blockers, as I've already said, we start beta blockers in an anti, uh, as an antihypertensive first line only if the patient has concurrent post MI, has arrhythmias, or is in heart failure, or a woman who is planning to become pregnant. Because in pregnant women, we know that we cannot give them AC inhibitors or ARB. So we were talking about a fixed a single pill combination. Now, which single pill combination would we ideally choose? If you look at the ESC guidelines and the uh, studies that, uh, that they cited, uh, one of the studies was the ASCOT study. And in the ASCOT study, it was a combination of perindropril with amlodipine. And there they showed a 16% reduction in cardiovascular risk. They also cited other trials with ARB and uh, calcium channel blockers, but no, none of the st uh, studies with ARB and calcium channel blockers could show any significant res result in cardiovascular protection. So it seems that the studies that uh, were cited, AC inhibitor, with a calcium channel blocker gives better results in protecting our patients than a ARB and a calcium channel blocker. And indeed, uh, there are innumerable studies which use AC inhibitors and calcium channel blockers uh, to study and see the reduction in cardiovascular risk. So, uh, when our patient comes to us with hypertension, obviously we give the patient lifestyle advice. We really have to do a proper job of that, just not say it and not mean it. Make, be passionate about it and motivate our patients to do lifestyle modification. Now, if our patient has blood pressure above 160 and 100, this means we immediately start the drugs along with lifestyle modification, we have to start the drug. However, if the patient has 140 by 90 blood pressure, and if the patient has concurrent uh, hypertension mediated organ damage, like he comes with CKD or he has heart failure, et cetera, we start his medication immediately. However, if the patient does not have any evidence of any uh, hypertension mediated organ damage, obviously we give him lifestyle modification advice, follow that through, and only after three to six months do we start him on some medication. And uh, so what would be the medication? Step one would be a angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor with a calcium channel blocker. Step two, uh, we would increase the dose. Step three, we would add a diuretic. And for resistant hypertension, we would need to go for additional drugs like spironolactone or other drugs. So which A, and should we choose angiotensin converting enzymes or ARBs? And if it's angiotensin and converting enzymes, what uh, should we choose? which calcium channel blocker should we choose and which diuretic should we choose. Now, if you consider the diuretics and if you look at all the uh, guidelines that have been published, it seems that although both thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics remain, initial treatment options preference is now given to longer acting thiazide-like diuretics like chlorthalidon and indepramide. And if you look at the literature, indeed, indepramide seems to be more effective than chlorthalidon, and it gives better cardiovascular protection according to a meta-analysis. And there have been innumerable studies which have uh, showed how effective indepramide can be. And if you look at other drugs, uh, in the ASCOT study, we already know that in the uh, hypertension uh, controlling arm, uh, one of the group of drugs that they studied was amlodipine with perindropyl. And that arm showed better uh, success in cardiovascular protection. Uh, so the perindropyl plus amlodipine combination significantly pr provides long-term protection for our hypertensive patients. 
So what about other AC inhibitors and ARB? A randomized trial of perindropyl, enalapril, losartan, and telmisartan in overweight or obese patients with hypertension showed that there was better blood pressure lowering effect with uh, perindropyl compared to losartan and telmisartan. And what about if we compare AC inhibitors with ARB? Now, in the on-target trial, they compared a telmisartan uh, with the ramipril, and uh, the conclusion in the editorial was, as the fourth and largest comparative study, the on-target study confirms beyond doubt that angiotensin uh, converting, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers are not better than angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors at reducing fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events. And what if we compare two angiotensin converting enzymes to one another? Uh, well, we know that the HOPE study was a huge study that uh, studied ramipril, and I Europa was a huge big study which studied perindropyl, but these are two separate studies. But if we look at their outcomes, we can see that uh, the heart failure reduction, hospitalization for heart failure uh, was significantly lower in the perindropyl group in the Europa trial as compared to the HOPE trial. So for heart failure patients, maybe a perindropyl is very effective. And what about uh, uh, if you do a meta-analysis reporting effects of AC inhibitors and ARBs in patients uh, without heart failure, but with myocardial risk reduction, uh, it seems that uh, perindropyl has the highest reduction in case of patients who suffer from myocardial infarction as well. And if you consider uh, remodeling. Taufik was talking about remodeling. So effects of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors with perindropin on left ventricular remodeling, that showed that there was significant better outcome uh, when perindropil was used. Now, in many patients who suffer from hypertension, they also concurrently suffer from diabetes. And if you look at the advanced trial uh, where major macro and microvascular events were studied uh, with the combination of perindropril plus indepramide, it seems perindropril plus indepramide did significantly better than placebo with a hazard ratio of 0.91. And in the, in the advanced effects on mortality also, perindropyl and indepramide did better with all-cause mortality as well as in cardiovascular death. Many of our hypertensive patients end up with strokes. And uh, so if you study the PROGRESS trial, in the PROGRESS trial, this was a randomized trial of a perindropyl bet based blood pressure lowering compared um, to a placebo, and there was significant reduction when perindropyl was used. However, the PROFESS trial, which compared telmisartan with placebo, did not show any such risk reduction for stroke patients. So obviously, uh, AC inhibitors seem to be better in mortality reduction in meta-analysis compared to ARBs. And, uh, but one thing, uh, one issue with the uh, AC inhibitor seems to be the cuff. Now, lots of uh, physicians, we, when our patient comes to us with cuff and is on an AC inhibitor, we seem to have a knee-jerk reaction and we immediately stop the AC inhibitor and switch to an ARB or not. But one thing we need to remember is that the incidence of cough with angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors is 13.5. And with, uh, with a placebo, it's almost 9%, 8.5%. And if you look deeply into the cuff situation, in 63% of all cuff cases on angiotensin converting enzymes were potentially not caused due to the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Maybe it was some concurrent flu or some other thing or some other drug he was taking. So other causes of cuff should be definitely excluded before an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor is withdrawn because angiotensin converting enzymes have 
proved unequivocally that they really do reduce cardiovascular mortality. And re-exposure to an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor should be carried out before continuous withdrawal or replacement of an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, especially in patients with heart failure. And actually, if you compare cuff, the incidence of cuff seems to be lowest with parentropil. And uh, just a brief reputation, meta-analysis have indeed, when comparing uh, AC inhibitors with ARB, showed that AC inhibitors consistently give better outcome. So in summary, we have to understand there, uh, that in the vast majority of hypertensive patients, we will require triple uh, combination drug therapy with a calcium channel blocker, an AC inhibitor, or ARB, and a diuretic. Now, this is the reality. Because if we really want to control the patient's blood pressure, we will need at least triple therapy. And... Uh, we also uh, need to understand that uh, the ESC guidelines prefer both an AC inhibitor and a C, uh, calcium channel blocker to initiate the therapy in the general population. So this is a great combination if we want to use it. And there is overwhelming consensus that an AC inhibitor and an ARB is the first line antihypertensive therapy for patients who have diabetes mellitus. And there is also an overwhelming consensus that an AC inhibitor or an ARB is first-line antihypertensive agent for patients with CKD. And there are huge guidelines to support uh, these. So if you look at the 2017 ACC, uh -huh, for CKD hypertension, AC inhibitors uh, first. Uh, in 2018, ESC guidelines uh, it, for diabetes and CKD, AC inhibitors first. So if we go through the guidelines, AC inhibitors, long anting diuretics, and calcium channel blockers like emlodipine just pop up as the front uh, users that we should use. So what is our take home message? Our take home message is that we really need to treat our patients to reduce the cardiovascular risk and to reduce cardiovascular mortality. And that means that we need to give them lifestyle advice as well as drugs. And our drug treatment should be first based on how affordable the drug is, if affordability or cost is not an issue, definitely we will try to give combination pills to our patients to make his life easier. And with that, I would like to say thank you. Thank you. And now I would request Dr. Mir Ishraku Zaman to come and give us more insights into complicated cases of hypertension, hypertension, urgencies, emergencies. Thank you, Dr. Ishraku Zaman. The floor is yours. Thank you, madam. Honorable Chief Guest, National Professor Brigadier Abdul Malik, sir, respected uh, chairpersons and panelists and audiences, assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Dr. Mirisha Kuzaman, consultant cardiologist. So I'm going to have a talk on hypertensive crisis. So, as we have already heard that hypertension is a common, common globally, and it's also common in the emergency. And it's not that much rare because pre preven prevalence of hypertensive crisis emergency in some literature, literatures is up to 20 to 20%, whereas prevalence of hypertensive emergency is 0.6 to 3.2%. So when a patient come to the emergency, we face few questions in emergency, like whether to admit this patient or not, whether we need to go for quick reduction, will it be helpful for the patient or will it be harmful for the patients? And should we start IV antihypertensive or we, we may keep the patients with oral antihypertension and discharge the patient? So uh, hypertensive crisis, it's defined as the severe elevations in blood pressure that have the potential to cause target organ like heart, vasculature, kidneys, eyes, brains damage. This includes that hypertensive urgency when there is no evidence of acute and ongoing hypertension mediated organ damage and hyperten hyperten hypertensive emergency when there is evidence of acute ongoing hypertension 
tension mediated organ damage. So often there, uh, there lies precipitants and risk factors, which actually figures this hypertensive crisis. So most of the commons are uh, non-adherence to medical treatment and inadequate treatment of chronic hypertension. Uh, other risk factors like male genders, black race, low social uh, economic status, obesity, smoking, and pre-existing conditions like uh, uh, chronic renal disease, collagen vascular disease, often we see in scleroderma with uh, hypertensive crisis, pheochromocytoma where there is catecholamine excess, vasculitis, preeclampsia in pregnant patient, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and also medications are and illicit drugs, which also triggers the hypertensive crisis like cocaine and amphetamines. So underlying mechanism is the uh, loss of autoregulation. We know that in normal tensive patients and adequately controlled hypertensive patients, uh, this regulation actually functions normally in range of mean arterial pressure from 60 to 120 millimeter of mercury. When a patient comes to uh, with the abrupt and sudden onset of severe blood pressure, then this exceeds uh, this range, and thus this uh, uh, then the loss of autoregulation occurs, and systemic vas uh, uh, vasoconstriction occurs, and causing the endothelial dysfunctions and further damage to the endothelial cells and arterial fibrinoid necrosis res, uh, occurs, and as a result, end organ ischemia and edema. So uh, during the treatment, we definitely, we need to keep in our mind that in chronically hypertensive patients, this range of mean arterial pressure shifts to the right. So arterial, as arterial or smooth muscles hypertrophy allows tissue tolerance of higher blood pressure. So when we, rapidly reduce the blood pressure in these patients, there might be tissue hypoperfusion and ischemia. So what will be our approach? We need to act immediately. We need to identify of both hypertension and potential organ damage. And uh, this patient should be admitted in ICU and therapy must often begin before a comprehensive patient's evaluation. A brief history and physical examination should be initiated, which includes the history of hypertension or other medical disease, medication use and compliance, drugs of abuse and withdrawal, and symptoms we should elaborate like neurologic symptoms, cardiac symptoms, and venal symptoms. And from the physical find findings, definitely we need to measure deep blood pressure in both arms. And we need to elicit signs of neurological ischemia or focal neurological deficit. And direct ophthalmologic examination is mandatory. And auscultation of the lung and heart also needed. Evaluation of the abdomen and peripheral pulses for brewery masses or uh, deficit is also needed. So bedside urinalysis actually gives us clue for the uh, acute renal injury, like proteinuria and hematuria. ECG also gives us a clue of left ventricular hypertrophy and as well as my myocardial ischemia. Cardiac, mar mar uh, cardiac mar markers of ischemia should be sent, like CKMB and troponins, full blood count, renal function test, chest X-ray, and for the evaluation of etiology like echo, CT, and MRI should be done. So these are the clinical presentation. A patient may present with accelerated hypertension when the patient present uh, to the emergency with severe hypertension, often uh, more than 220 over 120 millimeter mar mercury with advanced uh, bilateral retinopathy like flame hemorrhage, exudates and papillidema. Many patients, uh, presence with the som somnolence, lethargy, tonic, chronic seizures, and cortical blindness, which may proceed uh, to a loss of consciousness. Uh, these patients are of hypertensive encephalopathy. But if we find there's a focal neurological deficit, please, we need to exclude whether the patient develops stroke or not. Among the other clinical presentations, hyper hypertension thrombotic microangiopathy is also common. But often the many patients present to us with an elevated blood pressure, but they have the other serious conditions like acute myocardial ischemia, acute aortic dissections, acute heart failure, many uh, pregnant 
patients with uh, preeclampsia or severe hypertension, and in case of pheochromocytoma, uh, where the excessive catecholamine cause sudden severe hypertension with associated organ damage. So what is the goal of treatment in case of hypertensive emergency? So immediate but controlled reductions of mean arterial pressure. Blood pressure should be reduced initially by no more than 25% of mean arterial pressure over minutes to hours. And then after first 24 hours for the reductions over day to weeks in order to reset autoregulatory mechanism. There are some exceptions I will talk about later. It's aortic dissections, pulmonary edema, postoperative bleeding. So what are the medications actually we use in the hypertensive emergencies? These are the uh, common drugs that we use in our emergency, like nitroglycerin, nitroprusides, labetalol, metoprolol, phentolamine, uh, and also magnesium sulfate for the uh, preeclampsia. All these drugs actually have a short-acting, uh, short-acting uh, duration actually, and they act very quick. So uh, these are the hi hypertensive emergencies uh, recurring immediate blood pressure reductions. So like acute coronary event, uh, there we do not, we cannot wait for hours. We need to reduce the syst systolic blood pressure less than one for. Uh, 40 millimeter of mercury because as we want to get uh, want to give want to do the thrombolysis then we need to keep the blood pressure uh, less than 180 and less than 110 if the patient present with acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema the blood pressure systolic blood pressure should all should also be reduced to less than 140 millimeter of mercury in acute aortic dissections not only reducing systolic blood pressure to 120 millimeter of mercury, but we also need to reduce the heart rate to less than 60 uh, beat per minute. And in eclampsia, I have, uh, I have, uh, it's immediately reductions we need to do of uh, systolic blood pressure to less than 160 and diastolic blood pressure to less than 105. In this case, actually, we use uh, magnesium sulfate. Libetalol can also be used, and uh, nicodipine can also be used. Most of in uh, most of the emergencies, we can actually use labetalol, nicodipine, nitroglycerine, and then nitroprusides. Especially uh, in the acute cardi cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we also use uh, loop diuretics. So if a patient's present with uh, acute stroke and elevated blood pressure, we do not need to reduce the blood pressure unless the patient have more than two to 20 millimeter of mercury. Otherwise, the reduction of this blood pressure may cause harm. Uh, but uh, in case if we plan to give, if, if we plan to do thrombolysis in ischemic stroke, then definitely we need to lower the systolic blood pressure to less than 185 and diastolic blood pressure to 110 millimeter of mercury. But uh, otherwise, the blood pressure uh, should not be reduced immediately. So hypertensive urgencies, as we understand that there is no uh, evidence of target organ damage or hypertension mediated uh, organ damage. So we can, we can uh, treat this patient as a outpatient department basis with oral medications. And the goal will be lowering to mean arterial pressure by 20% in one to two days with further reduction to goal ambulatory levels in weeks to months. An outpatient follow-up should be arranged within 48 to 72 hours uh, to ensure compliance and to emphasize need for long-term BP control to lower cardiovascular risk. So this is the algorithm. So it's clear that when a patient comes to emergency with elevated blood pressure or hypertensive crisis, we need to look for the target organ damage. If the patient has target organ damage, the patient should be admitted in ICU. And immediately we need to start IV antihypertensive and uh, but if the and we we need to reduce the systolic blood pressure less than 140 and uh, less than 120 in case of aortic uh, dissections if it's immediately but on the other hand so we need to reduce the blood pressure by maximum 25 percent over first hour then to 160 
uh, to one 10 millimeter of mercury over next two to six hours, then to normal over next 24 to 48 hours. So this is a prognosis. If untreated, uh, the prognosis of a patient with hypertensive crisis is poor. 10 year survival is around 70% in modern era with effective antihypertensive drugs. However, patients presenting with hypertensive crisis have for future cardiovascular events, despite a lower prevalence of overall cardiac risk factors. Uh, here, uh, I think I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ishraq Uzaman. So now, uh, we, uh, the <clears throat> lectures have finished and we can start our discussion. And uh, I would request uh, from our panel of e experts uh, to, uh, do they have any questions or any comments? So I would first request Dr. Habibur Rahman to make any comments. Dr. Habibur Rahman, are you there? Thank you, Vanem. Uh, I was just uh, busy in the cat lab. Uh, and, uh, okay, once, great. Uh, so, excellent deliberation. And hypertension in practice is a, a, a difficult problem. Sometimes we face to many. So, stick to the drugs and stick to the lifestyle modification is very important. So, we would like to uh, emphasize on the lifestyle and drugs as well as also to uh, drag, uh, and also we have the, some responsibility to prescribe drugs which can patient afford because uh, they are taking drugs for a long time. So we should remember while we prescribe drugs. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, do we have Dr. Ashok Dottu with us? So uh, Ashok, thank you for the initial slides that you provided me with. So do we have Dr. Ashok Dotto? Okay, maybe Ashok is also busy in the cath lab. If not, do we have Dr. Yes, oh, you I are, have, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, Ashok, thank, please. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Ma thank yeah. you. This is a great, uh, actually great initiative and program. I, I see initially there was more than 220 participants. So it is a, at this moment, active hours, uh, all the people's, I think, very much interesting in hypertension. Actually, this is the source of many of the cardiovascular disease, which can be treated and which can be treated with least cost. For even antiplatelet, antilipid, antihypertensive, I think the cost is less, and that is a very much uh, saving for the patient in long term. And all the speakers, uh, especially uh, Fujlamam and all others, that excellent deliberation. There is nothing to add, and I want to. Uh, thanks all of the uh, chairperson, my teachers, Professor Abdullah al Shapi Mojimdar, uh, Professor Mir Jamaluddin, Professor Abdul Wadu to attend this session and to uh, for uh, giving us the time. And definitely, I think I have learned a lot from this all all speakers. And uh, definitely, I like to thanks the organizer once again. Thank you, thank you, Osho. Now I can move on to Dr. Mir Nesaruddin. Dr. Mir Nesaruddin, uh, are you? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma I'd like to uh, congratulate trust for the National Heart and Hospital Hypertension Committee, especially for having such a wonderful uh, uh, seminar on hypertension. And it's a really uh, honor for us, for all of us, to having the uh, uh, Hello? Should I yeah, we can, Should I we can hear you. Yes. We can hear you. Yes. And all the speakers, particularly Professor Fozila, madam, as I use lecture, very iconic lectures. And really, you are, we are appreciating your lectures and especially you are iconic. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, hello? You are really proud of the national and international as well as a very good orator. And particularly, Hypertension is a very uh, special uh, subject for all, for all the physicians. And we have to remember uh, to treat the patient, especially regarding the um, uh, uh, lifestyle modification, including our drug as well. Yes, and particularly we have to prescribe the 
um, low price drugs first, especially considering the economic burden uh, situation of our patient. And last of all, I like to congratulate again for our professors, uh, Professor uh, Abdullah Shahim Bajinder Sahib, Ms. Dawal Sahib, and Dr. Abdul, Professor Abdullah Wadud Chaudhary, and all the learned speakers that have today. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Dr. Dhiman Boni. Uh, Dr. Dhiman Boni is a very uh, passionate about controlling his patient's hypertension, and I would like to hear what he has to say today. Dr. Dhiman Boni, are you there? Madam, I am here. Oh, good. Thank Madam, you. Thank you. Uh, Madam, thank you. Uh, it, it was a great lecture by you and other speakers also. Uh, uh, thank you, all the uh, uh, chairpersons and moderators for coming, uh, joining us in this session. Uh, one, uh, I want to mention uh, uh, one thing uh, uh, that there is a term which is known as unattended office blood pressure measurement. Uh, okay. uh, uh, this is an, uh, 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 it is a, uh, in some uh, 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 guidelines, it is uh, there uh, as an alternative of home blood pressure measurement or ambulatory blood pressure measurement. And this should be an important issue when there is a marked type hypertension or, uh, uh, or uh, white coat hypertension. And, uh, and another important thing that uh, Ishtrak has uh, uh, mentioned uh, classically, that there is a term that is what is the obligatory uh, uh, reduction of blood pressure within hours. There are three or four conditions that all physicians, it is for the juniors, uh, that uh, three, uh, three conditions, uh, three or four conditions, that is uh, one is eclampsia, eclampsia with hypertension. Another is pheochromocytoma uh, uh, pheo, uh, pheo crisis. And the next one is aortic dissection with hypertension. And other one is LVF, left ventricular failure. These are the obligatory reduction of blood pressure within hours. Uh, uh, with, with this, I want to thank uh, the speakers who are excellent. And Madam lecture was uh, excellent as usual. Uh, oh, thank uh, you. Uh, That's very kind. And I want to say my salam to Brigadier Sir for his uh, congratulation. He was always uh, inspiring to us. And other, uh, Shavi Mudunda Sir, Professor Wadud, uh, and uh, Meet Jamal Sir is there. Thank you all for patience sharing. Thank you so much. And now, can I request Professor Bodhuzaman to make a few comments? Professor Bodhuzaman. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, 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 actually, I enjoyed all the lectures uh, and I learned a lot uh, from uh, the lecture. And after the main problem, I think, with the hypertension is the classification. There are so many uh, guidelines, and they are so, um, they all differ in their uh, classifications. Uh, the American one uh, differs much from uh, others. So I think we should follow our uh, own guideline, which is uh, 140 by 90 or more. Because in American guideline, it is 130 by 80 or more is considered hypertensive. The interesting thing is that before uh, uh, SEC guideline, uh, only 30% of the patients uh, of their populations were hypertensive. After this guideline, 46% became hypertensive. It, and it make a huge burden on the insurance system of USA. So they were criticized for this aggressive approach of uh, defining hypertension. Later on, uh, ESC guidelines, they defined it at a 140 by 90. And then latest ISS guidelines, they also defined it as 140 by 90. I think in Bangladesh also, we should follow the America, uh, the US, uh, sorry, the ISS guideline, which is 140 by 90 or more. And regarding treatment, as Professor Fazila Malik has mentioned very nicely, that if the patient can afford, then we should go for the expensive combination therapy. Otherwise, we should always consider the cheaper options for the patients because we all know the treatment of hypertension should continue lifelong. So we should talk with the patient the how much he can afford monthly for his treatment. And accordingly, we should plan our treatment because we have got a lot of good drugs, cheap drugs, which effectively reduces blood pressure. And one thing I want to say to all the juniors, the benefit of hypertension lowering doesn't depend on the drug. That is 100% true. Don't get wrong message from the wrong studies. If you can able to lower the blood pressure, 
whatever the drug is, the benefit is safe. Thank you. I think the internet, is there an internet problem? So thank you very much. And uh, uh, I want to congratulate our national professor, Bigger uh, Malik sir for his achievement. We are really proud of him. And I also thank all our participants uh, and all panelists and chair, chair persons who attended this uh, conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you. And now, Professor Nazir Ahmed, we would be very grateful if you could uh, say a few words. Professor Nazir Ahmed. Yeah. I. Please. First of all, I like to congratulate Professor Brigadier Abdul Malik for its achievement for World Hypertension um, League for his uh, 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 award. And uh, I like to congratulate all the lecturers for, his, for their brilliant lectures. And I have seen Professor uh Jalaluddin sir most likely he is present or not I know in this time he is my mentor once and now if professor Jalaluddin is here I I want to tell something about this session overall there are a lot of uh, um, uh, discussion already done I'm not um, legalic that total uh, situation but I, I want to say something always prescribe less number of drugs with less number of price because the patients who are in front of us they rely on us that's why we want to uh, say they will continue or not for long time. And that's why, because hypertension is a long-term disease, it will continue all the lives. And that's why I think it is very important for long run. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have Professor Jalal with us? We would love to hear from him. Uh, that would be wonderful. Yes, I'm here. I'm Professor Thank Jalaluddin. you, sir. Islam alaikum, sir. It's wonderful to hear you. Alaikum salam. Thank you once again. Yes. And so, uh, COVID has at least taught us to meet each other virtually, <laughs> which is really uh, wonderful. Thank you, sir. I, I'm Nazir Bhai, and I we used to work for, yes. with Professor Jalal many, many years ago. And we both learned a lot from our sirs. And this is actually this uh, program, which was. Uh, organized has been wonderful because we could meet you, sir. So, sir, any comments from you? Yes. Good luck. Yes, sir. Please. Yes, sir. Are you hearing me? Yes, yeah, I can uh, hear you, sir. Yes. Uh, today, I am very much grateful to uh, Sarvayar to invite me here. Uh, that's why I have uh, I have got a great opportunity to see my great teacher, Professor Abdul Malik, National Professor Brigadier Abdul Malik, to whom with, I had a long companion with him because when he was in uh, easy hospital, I was clinical assistant in medicine. But though I, am, I was in medicine, by round the clock, we had to work in cardiology also with Professor Brigadier Abdul Malik. So afterwards, then I had to be with him from the almost the beginning of NICVD for more. Than 10 years with Professor Brigadier Matmi as his junior colleague, and he was my great teacher also. And when I was a student in uh, FTPS course yeah. in PG Hospital. And, and today I am very much grateful to be here to see his face after quite a long time for COVID. Uh, and at the same time, I am very happy to meet. Uh, I'm very much grateful to see the, uh, Professor 
Fudir uh, Dumnesha also, because he was my register while I was Professor of Cardiology in NICBD. Because uh, the, he is now in such a status in World International Cardiology. Uh, he is now a, a great name in the, in the country as well as abroad. That's very so kind. Uh, so I am very much uh, proud for him. And uh, Professor uh, Nazir Hamad, he mentioned my, my name. I guess it really, I appreciate him that his home is somewhere in the, uh, sometime in the picture. That's why he mentioned my name. He was my student. And uh, he's really a, a very sensible and uh, physician because he mentioned that how to re reduce the number of drugs because hypertensive patient, diabetic patient has to take these drugs throughout the life. If we mention uh, prescribe the costly drugs, it will hamper the uh, treatment of the common people, not only the patient himself, the whole family also. So, I congratulate uh, Professor Nazir Ahmad to mention his uh, comment on this uh, hypertension treatment. Thank you, sir. So I don't like to uh, uh, elaborate my lecture. I also uh, congratulate my other uh, favorite Nazir Ahmad, and also Professor Abdullah Tuchudari, Mir Jamaluddi, Shafi Mutundar. They are here. I'm very happy to see him as the panelist. Thank you very much, Professor Fudiratunna, sir. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Actually, uh, Professor Kondokar Kamrul Islam, I had requested him earlier on. Maybe at that time he was busy. I understand he has joined us now. So if he could say a few words, that would be wonderful. Uh, professor Khandokar Kamrul Islam is the Professor of Cardiology at Universal Medical College and Hospital, Mahakali Dhaka. So if he is with us virtually, we could maybe uh, share some insights with him. Hello. So Professor Khandokar Kamrul Islam. So we have SM Kamrul Hawk with us. Maybe you can. So it seems we don't have the, uh, our panel panel of expert, Dr. Khandukar Kamrul Islam with us. We have, uh, we are so grateful today. We had such a wonderful audience and all of you who came as audience, I mean, you all are yourselves experts in the field of cardiology, and we are truly humbled and truly grateful that you came. And it would have been wonderful if all of us could share our experience and learn and talk. Yeah, but unfortunately, it's like uh, the hours are ticking by and time is running out. So I think we need to close this session. But before we do that, I uh, believe that Serbia would like to give a vote of thanks. And I my, myself would personally like to thank Serbia for doing such a wonderful job of arranging this conference with us. So Serbia uh, would be giving us a vote of thanks now. So do we have the gentleman who's going to give that? Yes, or is he going to? Yes, yes please. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, madam. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, respected uh, chief guest, uh, uh, honorable um, uh, Brigadier uh, Abdul Malik, uh, who is actually after a long time I, uh, I, I could see him in this uh, uh, due to this program. And uh, um, thank you all, actually, uh, all the chairpersons, uh, the panelists, uh, the speakers, and also all the participants. Uh, uh, thanks to our National Heart Foundation for giving us this opportunity uh, to, to be a partner uh, of this uh, very, very uh, uh, good program. Uh, you know that uh, Servier is actually um, is one of the leading uh, research company in hypertension management. 
And uh, we have uh, um, several uh, research molecules, uh, which actually are uh, um, being used uh, for treating hypertension globally, um, millions of patients. And we actually, uh, despite uh, many difficulties, uh, we still are uh, continuing our uh, uh, making available our drugs, uh, our research molecules here in Bangladesh. As you mentioned that uh, this AC inhibitor, uh, especially this perindrophil and also endepamide, these are our research molecules. And uh, millions of patients uh, globally are uh, uh, getting benefits uh, from these uh, drugs, uh, from this research. And uh, I would like to actually mention one uh, or share one information with you. In the program that Sir, please unmute yourself. Sorry, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, we can. We oh, can. okay. Sorry. So, uh, anyway, so I don't know actually how uh, in uh, um, uh, how, uh, how much actually I could uh, you hear uh, from uh, me, but uh, uh, okay. So what I was actually mentioning that uh, Servi is a research uh, company, and um, we have uh, several research uh, uh, molecules in hypertension management, and uh, like uh, perindrophil and uh, indapamide. So, um, as you mentioned also that, uh, you know, this uh, inhibitor, which is actually leading uh, or, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, suggested by the many guidelines uh, uh, for using and uh, treating hypertension. And today, this, uh, you know, hypertension day uh, in this program, I would like to actually um, uh, thank you for actually mentioning uh, this uh, in this program with uh, all the physicians of Bangladesh. So um, uh, I was mentioning that I was telling that uh, despite many difficulties, we are still uh, one of the few multinationals who are actually making available our research molecule uh, for your patients. And uh, uh, with your help, uh, uh, we can actually continue uh, this journey. Otherwise, maybe, you know, you all um, physicians may uh, not have the opportunity uh, of access of uh, these research molecules in Bangladesh. So uh, I also would like to mention that Servi is a foundation and all the research, all the uh, profit of Servi actually goes to further research and uh, to give you a um, new drug or to me, uh, for unmet need uh, to treat your patients uh, uh, for especially in hypertension. So um, uh, with this uh, comment, I would like to thank you all again for uh, allowing us uh, to be a, a partner of this uh, session. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, uh, Fazilit Nasa Malik, uh, for your uh, all support uh, uh, to organize this uh, program uh, and uh, also to be a part with the uh, Heart Foundation. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, it's been almost two and a half hours now. It's 2.30, getting too late for lunch. So I think we, due to lack of time, we would have loved to have heard from all our guests who came and took the time to be with us. We're truly grateful. And inshallah, I'm sure we can have many such programs again in the future. And I would like to thank our chief guests, our chairpersons, and all the panel of experts, and all of the guests who came, listened, gave their opinions. And some of you couldn't give your opinions because of lack of time. But all of you have such a vast experience. And we look forward to more such occasions where we can discuss and where there won't be any constraint of time, inshallah. And with that hope, thank you again for coming, for joining, and uh, for sharing, giving you your valuable time to us. And hope to see you again soon, inshallah, not virtually, but in present. And take care. And with that, I would like to say goodbye.